right, let, let, let me let me get this uh, let me get this intro yeah, done. Get the intro in. <laughs> I don't even know what I just talked about it. anymore. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlisle. This is Value After Hours. I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Jake Taylor and Bill Brewster. Jake, what's your topic this week? I'm going to be, with the passing of Neil Pert, uh, the drummer of Rush, I'm going to cover three lessons that Rush can teach us uh, as investors. Ooh. And Bill, what are you talking about? We're going to talk about whether or not there is a way to capture more of the right tail in some of these investments and whether or not uh, focus on errors of commission has precluded uh, some good decision making. And I'll be talking about Barry Diller and IAC and acquisition as a growth strategy coming up right after this. Tobias Carlisle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, we will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit Acquire'sFunds.com. What's the what's the what's the deal with Rush? Rush and value investing? <laughs> yeah, I've got three lessons that uh, that Rush can teach value investors. So who's Rush? Well, uh, this started because uh, last week Neil Pert, the drummer of Rush, passed away, uh, and it, it you know it turned out that there were more Rush fans out there, I think, than people realized. Yeah, there's um, a big outpouring of grief on Twitter. I saw that. Yeah, and and for good reason. Um, the guy was an amazing drummer, but not only that, like he seems like he's a pretty amazing human. Um, so, <clears throat> what? Well, let's start with lesson number one, I guess. Let's just jump right into this. Uh, so it's it's 1976, and Rush has had three studio albums. They're like doing, they're playing, you know, concert halls. Basically, they're not, you know, big time. They've had one hit, "Fly by Night," and their last album just flopped. The record company's pissed. They want something very mainstream, like give the people what they want, right? Rush says, no, not going to do that. In fact, we're making a sci-fi concept album, and the first song is 20 minutes long, which is never going to be on the radio, right? Wow. So they doubled down on their own creativity because that's what they wanted to work on. Now this this saw this the the album is 2112 and it's this story about um, all it's this kind of dystopian future where all individuality and creativity has been outlawed basically and this the world is the solar system is ruled by the the solar federation um, and everyone's controlled by these priests who basically they they take orders from this big computer bank uh, and it. I'll let everyone, you know, put their tinfoil hats on and say, like, how much does that resemble the Fed today? Uh, <laughs> but um, so there's no music and there's no art. And this this nameless man finds this old beat up guitar in a cave and, you know, he starts playing it and he takes it to the priest to tell to show it to them. And uh, I'm not going to ruin I'm going to it's a spoiler. For, uh, I'm going to let people listen to the song themselves. But. So when I was about 10 years old, my dad, uh, always been really into music. He brings me down to the basement where he kept all of his, like, uh, you know, the good, the good stereo. He puts the headphones on me, gives me like the liner notes and he plays this song 2112 for me. And, uh, I, I shed a little tear at that point. It's, it was a moving, it connected with me. Um, so everyone else, you know, you can listen to it and listen for the, just really listen for the musicianship that these guys have. I mean, you know, they're, they're these farm boys from Canada and yet the three of them individually are, are arguably the best at their instrument of, of anybody. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So the first lesson there is, you know, they're, they're down on their luck The everyone wants them to do one thing and they totally go on their own and do, they double down on what makes sense to them, what they want to work on. Um, they're pure, they're really artisans of, of music. And I think good value investors today are, are artisans of studying businesses and, and, um, taking advantage of that. So that's lesson number one. What, what is an, what is an artisan? I would say someone who pays like a special care and attention to the task that is that's at hand that they're working on, like the, what they're creating or producing. 
Um, and is it and, distinguished from artist? Is it like artist is someone who does something for non-commercial reasons, and an artisan is someone who does something for commercial reasons? I'm just I asking. Know. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't heard that um, those definitions that way, but maybe that does make sense. I like, always understood that artisan was slightly lesser than an artist. Like artist was someone who was doing it for the sake of the art, and an artisan was someone who was it was commercial. Bill, any ideas? Sorry. I got nothing. I've derailed you, mate. Keep going. <laughs> I'm a little stuck in my own head thinking uh, 2112 is the year that Tesla is going to engulf the entire market cap of the world. It's going to get there faster than that. <laughs> yeah, we're on, we're on pace for much sooner than that. That's for sure. All right, so lesson number two. It's, it's 1992, and Neil Peart, the drummer, um, you know, he's already been inducted into the, the Drummer Hall of Fame like he's widely recognized as one of the greatest drummers to ever touch a drumstick. And he decides that he takes on a coach, actually. Um, this guy named Freddie Gruber, who's like kind of a, a famous drummer coach or and then drummer in his own right. And he completely reinvents the way that he plays drums. And he pulls in all this soul into it that before he was just like, so precise like a you know like a robot before but now now he's talking about like playing the space in between the the drum hits you know like and and he takes it to a whole nother level right so lesson number two for for us is that here even when you think you're the absolute goat there's always room to be improving working on your game looking to reinvent yourself i like that one i think that's a good one they're all good. Toby. And I, I love the I love the fact that he went from. <laughs> well, I haven't heard the third one yet, but I, I yeah, agree fair. so far. I like it, but I, I like the idea of uh, getting a little bit of soul in there too. Yeah, I'll let you figure out what that means. I get for a little soul process. in my Excel spreadsheets, you know, syncopate <laughs> the uh, the cells and things like that. <laughs> yeah, on, exactly. On the offbeat. Get down with some circular references. <laughs> Ref- I. So- uh, that's interesting because the uh, the Acri article has got me. You know, I mean, I've been like pretty in my own thought process about that. Still it's reeling. One of those... Still reeling from the Acri article. I'm just thinking on it, man. I'm not. I don't know that about reeling, right? But um, look, that guy's got a lot of wisdom. So it's not. Um, I, I think that not at least thinking about stuff like that is remaining somewhat stupid. Um, so you know, it's fine if if I get through this thought process and come back to my original answer, but at least I've questioned it, right? Which is sort of like this guy hiring a coach and going out and reinventing himself a little bit. I mean, I don't know where I'll come out the other side of thinking through this, but at least it's not staying still. Well, and isn't that the real attraction of this whole game is that it, it forces you to grow. Otherwise you're going to get left behind. Like it's always adapting to what you, you might be good at. Um, and and you have to you it pulls you into a better version of yourself if you really are dedicated to it. You can do the opposite too. <laughs> but yes, fair, I, fair point. It's always pulling in some direction. Well, that's an interesting point. You have to be. I mean, this is one of the. It's kind of a truism of it that you if you don't adapt, then you get left behind. And you know, but. By definition, the people who are still in it are the ones who've managed to adapt, and so you don't see the ones who get left behind. But then also you have to be careful because there are lots of cycles where if you start doing what is popular in the cycle, you're going to get whipsawed when we go back to a more normal. It's 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 devilishly difficult to do. I don't know what the solution is, but it is something that I think about a lot, and particularly at what you're talking about. Like, do you... This market has been particularly kind to growthier value investors. It's been a very, very good period for growthier value investors. So does that mean you want to start incorporating more growth into your forecasts? I don't know. I mean, it's it, it every year that I have thought this is the year when we go back to a more normal cycle, that hasn't happened. You just keep turning it up to a... I thought it was already at 11. Now we're yeah. keep turning it. <laughs> we're at 13 now, I think. All right, so lesson number three. It's 1997. He's on top of the world, you know. His 19-year-old daughter dies in a car crash, his only only kid. And 10 months later, his wife passes away from cancer. Ugh. Yeah, talk about just a brutal, 
brutal year. So was he he disappears and he rides his motorcycle around northern and and central America for like a year and covers like 55,000 miles. And he says what brought him back to from the brink was to just be out in nature like that and to see so much of the the earth and to have a like reconnect with part of it was like with how small he is in the world and and insignificant really but but more like look at nature and the amazing things and and the beauty there and he comes back and he gets ends up getting remarried having another kid um i think the lesson for us there is that during difficult times maybe we shouldn't be wallowing and uh or looking to everyone else for the answers and maybe we should be spending a little bit more time in nature a little bit more time disconnected a little bit more time with our own thoughts to process things. Um, and, and it might serve us well. That's a good thought. I, I, I sort of think that I need to meditate on that. I hate, I hate to have the, I hate to be filling up the air with, with nonsense thoughts, but I don't want it to be dead air either. So I don't know. I need to think about that one. I think it's, I, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think, you know, it's, um, sometimes it, well, everyone has a tendency to think what's going on in their own life is what matters. Uh, and, and more often than not, it's really not. So well, what does I agree. Matter? I don't know if that's a dead comment or not. What, but, what uh, does matter? Well, I mean, other than like my family and stuff, I don't know what it, my portfolio really doesn't. You know, I mean, my my ego wants it and I want to be known as somebody that does this well. Um, but the world doesn't really care if I'm here or not. So as long as I'm sort of, I I think being prudent, I mean, I, I probably, I I found the drunken Miller interview pretty interesting and listening to him talk about how his portfolio is now that he's running his own capital versus how much risk he might be willing to take if he was running other people's and in the race. What did he say? He said did it, he take did moral that feel risk? backwards when he said that? He, yeah. It did seem backwards because a lot of the times he was like, you know, I'd probably be taking more risk if I was still in the game. Um, <laughs> but now that I'm running my own money, I've sort of backed off the risk. And, you know, maybe that's something that I – I should keep in mind. I think I probably have not hit the accelerator as hard as I can because, you know, there's real consequences to messing that up. And I, I think that's true if you're participating in a fund structure too. But um, maybe what Drux said is impolitic, but true. Everybody likes to say, you know, what I, I'm, I'm most careful when I'm running outside money, but maybe, I mean, that's, that's why you want to see the manager with lots of skin in the game, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that right. the the lesson is to the LPs in that message of, listen, the the incentives are for these guys a lot of times to be swinging for the fences, yeah, and reg- and trying to make a name for themselves, not necessarily to steward your capital through difficult periods. Or <laughs> well, and it's especially true in a lot of private equity funds. I mean that that incentive structure is such that at some point, I mean, I'm involved in a real estate one, and they tend to pull down a capital call every quarter and you know it's sort of like they're i almost feel like um i think they're doing good deals i don't think that they're doing stupid things but sometimes i wonder how much are you pulling in just to get your fees going right what what happens if you uh, don't meet a call and your carry if i don't meet a call yeah then i've defaulted but what happens to the to to the money you've already invested do you you Uh, forfeit that i would imagine I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure they have a claim to the extent that I mean they would probably try to sell my my interest to somebody else, but there's all kinds of penalties with that. Huh? You don't just get diluted by the other money or something. Uh, I th- I think that you may. I mean, I would need to go go through this, but I, I know that there are fees associated with it, and they'd probably place your slug with a different investor. Is my sense, but I don't know. And they're calling every quarter. Pretty much. Interesting. That seems like. There can't be that many deals out there that regularly, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the question, right? But I, I do think they're they're good at what they're doing, but I do question the incentive structure and how they how they call some of that. So, so. Barber, do I need a haircut this quarter? 
That's right. Yes. <laughs> oh, I do. Shoot. All right. You know, and then the other thing that I, I've said to I said to somebody at a family office, and he hadn't even thought of it, which makes me terrified of how that family office operates. But I, I was like, um, you know, the the difference between their marketed IRR and my my IRR is so different. That's some voodoo when, right there. When they're like calling, you know, I'm sitting here in cash waiting for a capital call. My IRR, my IRR is from the day that I've committed. Theirs is since they called it. And he was like, I didn't even think of it that way. I said, well, I mean, do you even know the game you're playing? That's terrifying, man. But anyway, I don't know how we got off, off that tangent. But I think it was, it was such a profound point that Jake made that we couldn't possibly talk about Move it for very long. We'd have, to put this, we'd have to put this podcast in another category. Yeah, that's, that, I guess maybe Last... I wasn't after hours enough. It's a good thought. I mean, I, 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 I haven't had enough, uh, pro, you know, I haven't had enough things happening as badly on that scale to kind of have to have had to have de- dealt with it. So I don't, I haven't thought about it enough, which is very lucky for me. Me too. So, Bill, what uh, what's your topic today? Uh, you know, I, it, piggybacking on the Acri sort of article thought, right? I I had sent out into the airwaves of the Twitter sphere that I thought that it was potentially a, not a mistake. I, my question was why are, why is a lack of errors of commission so revered in this game when the right tail can do so much of the work? I thought that was a very interesting point. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about that. Good. Uh, it, <clears throat> I sort of in the con- conversation diverted a little bit of the conversation to GameStop because I I had said if there's not much of a right tail, then I think an error of commission is almost certainly an error. But if there is the possibility of a right tail, then I don't think that you've necessarily made an error. That might just be probabilities manifesting in a negative way. Let's just define right tail. What what is that? Well, mean? yeah. So so that's part of it, right? I mean, how much? It's all a risk reward skew. So if you think GameStop is a ten cent dollar and it could ten x or five x or something like that, it's got plenty of right tail. I didn't mean it just as like buy compounders and let them go forever. That that wasn't really my thought process. What I was really getting at is, I feel like um, Buffett particularly is so revered for not making errors and i have massive respect for his track record but the other side of it is what if he had bought google when he said he should have um and and how do you balance Stick a billion that? in yeah that's right i mean whatever <laughs> so i don't know it's just the thought that i was i was coming upon and i think historically i have avoided things because i haven't wanted to make an error of commission in retrospect, I don't know if that's the right thing. Certainly, looking back today, I probably should have pulled more triggers, but you could say that about a lot of different things today. So I don't think today is the right framework, and you know, are you right for the right reasons is a whole nother discussion, but that's what was on my mind. I thought it was very interesting, and it helped me. I, I've been thinking about it too in, in this kind of context, right? So we're in, this, we're in this market right now, which seems to be rewarding very high growth companies and I have trouble getting comfortable with those with those com- companies but maybe the, the way through it is to say you know so Y Combinator you guys familiar with the Y Combinator model yeah. where mm-hmm. they take in every year they take in I don't know the exact number but it's something like this say say a hundred small entrepreneurs who have startup ideas and I think they seed them with like a hundred thousand each which I think means that they're committing 10 million dollars in capital in any given year to, the math checks out yeah, I just made that up on the spot, yeah. but it's something like that. It's it's roughly those that kind of scale, like many many small bets, with the idea that if you have lots and lots of these little small bets, one of them or several of them, you know, you kind of so they say you know the traditional model for a VC fund is to have ten positions, and you know that a handful are going to be massive winners, basically a handful break even, and the rest are losers. And the idea is that the massive winners make so much money that the the whole fund does really well so their approach is well let's not that you know if if you got you got to get lucky to get one or two 
out of 10. You've got to get less lucky to get 20 or 30 out of 100. So you just see a whole lot of these little positions. And so the way I, the, what I interpreted what you were saying, Bill, was you know, you're going to have a lot of these losers and it's very hard to distinguish between the, the, mass, the monster winners, you know, you, the, the Shopify's and the Netflixes and so on. So what you should do is you should have lots and lots of these small bets knowing that many, many of these are going to be errors of commission because in this instance making an error of omission is the worst error. So you want to have a tiny little part of all of these businesses that are going to go up 10, 20, 30, 60 times and that's how your portfolio works. So you take a, a kind of angel VC model and you put it into the public markets. Yeah, that was a bit of what I was thinking. I mean, certainly, you know, you don't want to make it with a concentrated bet. Um, but like Shopify was something I was looking at. I couldn't quite get there. I don't know. Would it have been smarter rather than ha having a hurdle that says I have to be able to put 5% of my portfolio into this? Is it enough to say, boy, I think this thing has like a very legit product, a super long runway and could work from here. So maybe a 1% position makes sense today. And if it sells off big time, you can still come over the top of 1%. That's not going to kill you. But, you know, I mean, right now it would probably be 4%. That's, it, and if you, you love know, the gross. position, and it, or if you love the underlying business and it's the valuation that you can't get comfortable with, if you put in a point and it backs off 50%, now you've got your price, stick in a point, you're still only, you still got a fairly small exposure to this thing, but now you've got your price, you've got 1.5% in it, maybe you take it up a little bit more even then. You know, I, I think that's a smart approach. I think there's something really interesting in it. It's part of what I'm thinking about, yeah. Like, there's some of these that I can't get there on valuation, but for the really good ones that I think are really awesome, like, does it make sense to have a little bit of exposure? And then, to your point, if it sells off, as long as my assessment of the business hasn't changed, buy a little bit more. I would, uh, I would push back to challenge that, at least my understanding is that VC funds have not returned very good results as a category. So maybe that's not something you're looking to emulate. I think VC tends to, I think that they say that, that like if you divide the VC universe into four, the, the very vast bulk of the games, gains are in the top quarter of VC funds. And the reason for that is unlike public market investing where any palooka can open up a, a brokerage account and take a little bit of Shopify, you need access to get the good investments in VC, and part of being a you know part of being a successful startup is I got benchmark right. to invest There's in a... me. That's the signal. It's not just money. They want the they want the uh, the brand. They want the imprimatur of somebody else to say this is a worthwhile investment. I always wondered how that word was pronounced. I, I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, <laughs> but I think that's what they used to call, that's how they stamped the coins. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I think what the my understanding um, is that you almost, <clears throat> in a VC fund, you can't afford that sin of omission because that one, if you miss it, if you don't have the one Google in that population, of startups, then you you miss like all of the returns basically. So you have to bet on everything to make sure that you capture the one crazy unicorn. Which makes it hard, right? It means you just gotta like every guy who walks in the door, you gotta stick some money. Here's in a check. Company. <laughs> yeah, well, you're certainly judging humans, right? And saying if I like this guy, I can't let him walk out the door, Travis especially Kalanick. if I like his product. Yeah, he walks you know, in the I door mean, and you cut him a big check. <clears throat> there's clearly a tension with this. I mean, you can't. You can't erode your criteria so much that you're just spraying at everything. But I do think that there's there's some gray area here that can be applied. And I mean, it's almost like a Chris Myers coffee can portfolio type, you know, 100 beggars. That would be where I would be looking to apply this sort, sort of thought process where it's like, I don't know, this thing could really be huge and it's got some traction does it make sense to just sort of coffee can that with a small percentage? I don't know. Ignorant evaluation? 
not ignorant of, but I mean, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you'd probably stretch on some of these. <laughs> but it's also true that all of the, I mean, we've discussed this before, but it's worth reiterating uh, that uh, all of the monster winners over, over time, Walmart, Microsoft, take your pick, have all come, have always come out of the most expensive decile. Like everybody knows that they are the companies where they want to invest. The thing is that even knowing that everybody underestimates how good they end up being. So maybe that. But then again, I, there's part of me that thinks this is a re, this is real bull market talk. This is real <laughs> so late cycle talk. This is right real now. Tesla tripling into the last you know six months. When when we've got the author of Deep Value talking potential VC strategies <laughs> in the public markets, so you know it's late cycle. Check check please. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, look, yeah. it's not how I run my money. My money is is not at all, I you know, in that way. But I I just I think that personally, I do not belong in the same sentence as Chuck Ackery, right, or Tom Russo, or Buffett, or any of these guys. So to look at what they've done and not at least think a little bit about how do how could I improve my process, I think is just silly. So that was one of the thoughts that I had. Equally, though, you know, Buffett, Buffett has. So I saw this funny comment on on Twitter. Somebody, you know, said Buffett and who, or Buffett's lieutenants. I don't know who did it, but whoever's taken the big position in Apple, and then it's had this monster run. And then someone said, "Does he sell?" It was a question that I got on Twitter. Like, it's so hard. I think, as we discussed before, like, it's so hard to get into those positions. He's he, he's there's so much money that he's put into it and and rolling around. Like, he just he can't get out. Like, he's stuck in. Apple now, even if he thinks it's overvalued, he just has to say, "Well, we're going to get. We've had a. We've had. We've front end loaded our returns. Yeah, but we're still never mind the tax consequences as yeah, well on right. that. You get liquidity and tax issues. There's no way he's selling out of that. It's not like with that kind of size, you can go into the option market either, right? <laughs> yeah, you can't <laughs> hedge out. Yeah. That's right. No way that they could absorb it. There's no hedging out. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I th- I think the same thing. I mean, I he's. I bet he's just like mad. I bet he's stewing a little bit because he's thinking about that the buybacks don't go as far and he's like, ugh, you know, but... Clogged my buyback thesis. That's right. I'm okay. sure it feels it feels good though also, but... I, I bet he doesn't think about it. We might much. be in the middle of the melt-up. I mean, it's very possible. There's There's been a lot of stuff going on that's... The market has melted up. It has been bananas. Tesla and Apple have just gone vertical. Yeah, I was talking NASDAQ. to my buddy. I said the other day, I said if you're if you were buying momentum and trading technicals, like at this stage you're just drawing a line straight up. Like this, it barely even moves horizontally. We're at that part of the cycle where the uh, sell side has to chase the price uh, targets. The price targets, <laughs> yeah, which is yeah. bizarre. Yeah. It's funny to see it. Like I, I uh, wasn't really. I was in. I was still in. I was still in law school when the the dot com boom was going on in real time, and I remember this happening. It didn't really happen two thousand seven to two thousand up to two thousand seven, or I don't remember it happening then. But I definitely remember it from two thousand. This is the real put your price target out, then just like increase it by fifty percent, and it's still wrong. It's still you got to update it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what they just did on Tesla, right? Somebody somebody wrote it up two hundred dollars and or fifty percent in uh. And what, like three months? Okay, that's that's a lot that changed. <laughs> they must have a real outlook change there. You know, the uh, the one guy who I thought would have been getting this a little bit wrong, I think he's actually getting it right. Uh, uh, Ross Gerber, Gerber, who has yeah. been, uh, he's very bullish on Tesla, but he said, when Ross Gerber says you should take a little bit of money off the table in Tesla, I think that we're getting to the, uh, we're getting closer to the uh to the end of that run than 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 the start of it it's a frustrating world when ross gerber is proved correct even if short term but it is what it is he he is one on this one i I don't i'm not i'm not i I think that he's i think that he's got a little bit more i think he's doing pretty pretty well i mean i don't he's got apple and 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 tesla right you can't even if you can't understand the method it doesn't mean there's no method there well, to be fair, when I say that, he pokes at Tesla Q. I mean, he's he's into the game, 
But right? Tesla so, Q is too. Yeah. The, I understand. So if the game frustrates you a little, like I'm just frustrated that that player currently is winning because I like the I like the research that Tesla Q is doing more than I like the the research that I see Tesla it's kind of doing. It's kind, you know, but, it's kind of like bombing on the VCs, right? Like the VCs come out and say, "Oh, we got we got to look at when you when you're doing an analysis, you should look at gross profits." And every analyst out there, every stock market analyst, every guy who's like looking at real businesses, just like, what are you guys, you, you guys have just discovered gross profits, <laughs> but you don't need it, right? Because the, they're doing something different. I, I don't know what he's doing, but it's, he doesn't need what he, he doesn't need the analysis that the shorts do anyway. It's worked. Uh, let's just say that uh, it's, it's very hard to tell brains and not no brains in a bull market. <laughs> Well, you know what's crazy is I, I've been thinking on that particular stock, what is the price action? And I can't imagine some of the margin calls that people are getting. I'm because I'm – oh, yeah. I'm sure when it was going down, I mean people pressed their bets. I you know, I don't know. I, I hope nobody blew up over this. I'm certain people have. Yeah, almost certainly. Uh, yeah. I mean, this it's it's vertical price action. There, there's that is margin calls. It the shorts not. have come down. The shorts have come down commensurate with the the, the price action. Yeah, because they of their course. accounts got liquidated. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, you can't you can't short it here either. Tommy Thornton, who does hedge fund telemetry, I think I hope I haven't got that wrong. He came out and said he's doubling his his Tesla short here, which I think is uh, aggressive. He's using some sort of technical analysis, DeMarc, exhaustion, that sort of stuff to look at it. Might be right. I mean, it looks like from without, you know, I'm not I'm not doing the statistical analysis on it, but it looks like that Didier Sornet wave. You, you I don't know, even the, know the words I that have you're no using. I have no idea what you just said, <laughs> so but sure. I, well, let's, yeah, if that's you're going to say it's overextended, I agree with you. Well, look, this is interesting. So <laughs> Didier Sornet, he's the guy, he, he's like, he was Taleb before Taleb was Taleb. And okay. Sornet came up with the term. He he. What what, uh, what Taleb calls a black swan, Didier Sornet calls a dragon king, and he named them dragon kings before Taleb called them black swans. The difference dragon is kings kill swans. That like we can settle that debate. Dragon right? kings kill black swans. Oh yeah, for sure. It's... But Sornet, the difference between Sornet and Taleb is Sornet looks at the price action and he he finds these like that. You know, you get that the line is going up and to the right, and it starts off kind of a, a the, you know, it's still it's still going up and down, but the wave is big, and then it gets to this point where the every every dip is bought so aggressively that it just it it gets into this very, and it's it's this is the sonnet wave or sonnet bubble, like the the every single dip is bought so aggressively until it just doesn't dip, and it sort of goes into this mm. vertical price action, from which point it sells off. The difference between Taleb and Sornet is Sornet says when you look, you you can kind of predict these things, and and Taleb's whole thing is these things are unpredictable, and By so definition. Sornet might be trying to short, whereas Taleb might say you have to find a, a a another instrument in order to express your view on this thing. So I lean more to Taleb's camp, mm -hmm. but but I I like I just. I just like the Sonnet idea. I don't. I would never trade on it. I just like it. And I've seen husbands written about Sonnet before. So you think Sonnet would be more likely to play like an exhaustion move in Tesla, whereas yes. Taleb would look at some of I, I don't know uh, some component part that traded correlated but was not quite as parabolic and so, he would maybe short that well so, so Taleb might express his view through volatility or something like that so volatility okay. may increase on the way up so this is another interesting thing this is for the stock market as a, in totality in the in there most of the time volatility is associated with a downward move. You get higher volatility as the market goes down. So the VIX spikes, the volatility index spikes as the market falls. And uh, when the market is going up, volatility is very, very low. And so that's why we've seen very low volatility for a long time. But volatility started picking up again recently. And this is behavior that we saw in the dot-com bubble where there was so much upside volatility. Volatility was actually going up before the market crashed and the volatility was quite high before the market crashed. Then when it went down, volatility went bananas. So I think that we're seeing that a little bit now, volatility going up while the market's going up. 
that's why volatility traders like they're in they're in a nice position they don't have to be directionally right they just sort of have to put on a trade that doesn't get them vaporized if vol goes down but leaves mm -hmm. them open to massive gains if vol if vol keeps on spiking i was looking at beyond the other day that's another one that's going nuts yeah back again yeah it's I, a lot of these names it, guys that i talked to on twitter that tend not to be too valuation focused even they're they're saying my portfolio looks a little rich right now. What do you think's the cause of it? I, I have no idea. I think Jake and I are going to agree on it. What do you think the, is the cause of it, Jake? FOMO? Oh, I don't know. Go I, on, say <clears> it. <throat> say it. If you don't say it, I'll say it. Fed liquidity? That's what I think. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I knew that's what you wanted me to say, but I'm not sure if that's true <laughs> or not. I've Honestly, like, I've... I have ratcheted down my my confidence of understanding in this game so yeah. hard the last yeah. three years. I used to think I knew what, like, kind of which way gravity fell. Yeah. Uh, and now I, I, I honestly I don't know. Like, I think gravity might go sideways. I, I'm not sure. It is curious though how um, how closely. I mean, in the, there's there's a correlation there, which is not to say it's causation, but the, that Fed balance sheet was was being sold off and value starts working again fed balance sheet kind of gets a vertical spike and then you look at apple and beyond and tesla and all of these things that um are already rich start getting very very rich i'm gonna push back on apple i actually think apple apple is not as crazy to me as some of the other things that i see i agree uh, at least you have true cash flow underlying I can articulate the bull case and can you get to a 30 multiple if you start doing relative valuation <laughs> yeah. boy that's the dog ate my homework for this entire rally <laughs> but I'm just saying I, well I mean, compared I, to this it's it's pretty that's good deal right. yeah and it's self-fulfilling right because yeah. you're like oh well lululemon's luxury retail apple's luxury retail why doesn't apple trade it 35 times I agree that Apple is yeah. different from those other two, but the reason that I raise Apple is just that from the bottom, it had a very good run. Part of that was because it was undervalued. Then part of that is because Buffett invests in it, so that gets a lot of attention from the value guys. Then it goes on a run, so it gets attention from the momentum guys. And now it's at that point where people who are buying it here are looking at the price section rather than the valuation, right? I think you got to have that a rosy outlook. Of the, yeah, you got to have a rosy outlook in a long time frame to be able to be right in my opinion on that stock right now which is why i sold it which in hindsight was a major mistake but you know <laughs> it's only a if somebody could have if somebody could have fast forwarded the world for me i wouldn't have sold yeah i mean shouldn't sell anything you should just be buying everything hand over fist that's right don't sell probably why acri lives in my head <laughs> could be toby uh we need to get to your topic. Yeah, let's. So I I uh, I said last week that I wanted to do Barry Diller and IAC. Uh, yeah. I, I don't really want this to be an analysis of IAC. It, I sort of want to do it more in the context, and I'm going to do a theme of uh, just because I'm interested in this uh, in this investment strategy. So Berkshire Hathaway is the original, maybe not the original, but the one that we all know. It's the uh, kind of compound growth through canny acquisitions through smart acquisitions right and so i had this kind of question is the uh do, are the are the gains that they have achieved because i mean i know the answer in relation to berkshire is because buffett is 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 a is a great investor why is it is it the nature of the companies or the businesses that they're targeting is it the discipline that they exercise in making these acquisitions or, or some combination of both, and probably the answer is both. As as, uh, as un un uh, anyway, I forget the word. Satisfying as that is. Yeah, it's unsatisfying. That's that's what I was looking for. As unsatisfying as that is. So that, there are a few examples of it. Uh, I think Barry Diller and IAC is a very good example of it. And then everybody knows Constellation and uh, Heiko. Heiko, how do you say it? Heiko, yeah. Heiko. Yeah. Then you got Roper Technologies. Yeah. I and want then to, ABM Bev, shout out to 3G. I want to do well. I'll do. I'll. I'll. I'll, I'll make a commitment to do all of those. I, I want to keep on going through because I'm kind of interested in uh, what you know. And but then you've got things like Valiant too, right? It doesn't. It yep. doesn't always work. And maybe Valiant was 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 blown up more by the fact that there was some 
the the fraud or whatever the uh, what's the what was the Philidor? Philidor. The Philidor fraud. Philidor. Yeah. Rather than, and maybe they were just overpaying too. So that that that's a problem, right? And there's there's lots of examples of conglomerate like conglomerates were very hot in the '60s, and these guys were doing all of these acquisitions where they were basically using their they were increasing their uh, their earnings per share by making acquisitions of slower growing companies that had higher earnings per share. And you that that causes this effect where you it looks like the entire enterprise is growing earnings per share very rapidly. I don't actually see what the difference is between what those guys are doing and what Berkshire and those other guys are doing. But what well, that's that's a I think I'll leave that kind of analysis to the end of it. But let's just talk about Barry Diller and IAC because I think it's kind of interesting. So uh, Diller had was already pretty successful. He'd been in uh, QVC. QVC had got taken over and he'd personally made about $130 million. So in 1995, he's sort of looking for something to acquire. And uh, he gets he, he, he gets Malone to back him into the home shopping network, which was basically just a collection of these UHF stations. But then he goes on this phenomenal investment spree from there on in. And uh, I, I'm kind of interested in, I don't, I don't really know what the theme is, but I'm, I'm interested in it. He, 1997, he bought uh, the USA Network, or he bought a part of it for $4.1 billion, which four years later, he flipped for $11.1 billion. Oof. Buys half of Ticketmaster in 1997 oh, for 210 monster deal there, yeah. He buys the other half in 2003. They spin it in 2008 for $15 billion. Oh. 1999, Match.com puts in $1.6 billion, currently worth $17 billion. Hotels.com, $244 million, wraps it into Expedia for $1.5 billion, currently worth $20 billion. And then in, in it, he's got this long list of deals. You can see it on the site. It's really, the, the site is great because it lists out each year and what they did in each year in this sort of um, one, one web page you can scroll through. 1999, um, so that, that basically the company now is, he's got Angie's, um, Angie's list. Home Services yeah. here, which is, which is part of Angie's list. And uh, Match is still like 85% roughly of each of those is basically the $20 billion market cap of uh, IAC in its totality. They got some cash in there. They're going to spin off some of these businesses. They've also got some really clever little things in there. So one of them is Ask Jeeves. Ask Jeeves still gets 120 million people through a month. It's kind of amazing. They um, turned that around too. That was pretty much a dying asset. And they, they just running it around. Cash run. Uh, yeah, there was actually Kara, Kara Swisher had interviewed the guy that turned that around. It was It was an interesting story because she was commenting on how rare it is to be able to turn an internet property and the fact that they could do it uh, was, you know, I mean, that's, that's really against the base rate. Do, have you, I mean, I, do you ever hear of Ask Jeeves anymore? Ask.com? Do you ever go there? I do not. No. Who, I, who's Google going there? What's it for? I, I'd have to Google it to find it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's... So I, I like the, I, uh, he, the, the, in addition to that, there's some other stuff. So they bought Vimeo, which was just getting destroyed by YouTube. This 32-year-old Harvard grad comes in and says, um, you should use it for putting up movies and things like that. So they make $200 million a year out of um, Vimeo now. So they got $5 billion in revs, $20 billion market cap, 3 to $5 billion in cash, going to spin up these other things, going to have some cash, going to be totally renewed, uh, where... I'm thinking that they're waiting for the market to come off a little bit and then they're just going to go on this monster buying spree. So the, the article that I got all this from, which is great, is Who Needs Moonshots from Forbes? And I'll stick it in the notes because it's a fascinating read. I've got to say, I didn't really know much about Diller before I read this. I've read his book, but the book ends before all of this happens. Yeah, I, because before that, he was, uh, you know, he, he was in charge of Fox and d had a pretty successful career already as an executive right. in the media he world. He created Fox, basically. Worked his way up from the mailroom, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating case study of, I, I feel like he, maybe I'm wrong, but like if I had to categorize the, the kind of deals that he's looking for, it's things that are kind of a little broken, and that you might be able to 
to cash flow if you can sort of get a few things figured out. And then things that seem like they're just going to be uh, eventualities. Like, so for instance, like Match, you know, he, I think, I think in that article it said that his nephew or something was saying, like, was you know, Diane I think everyone's going to be. Son. Yeah, everyone, you know, they're, they're going to be figuring, like, finding mates on the internet. And he's like, yeah, you know what? That makes sense to me. And so you go spend four billion dollars to to get like out in front of that wave. And he's been the dude really good understands about waves. the right tail. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's exactly right. And I mean, I that's was a thinking four about it in that billion context. dollar bet on the right tail. That's a big right? bet uh, of dating. That's a, that's not a small bet. I like that. There's, the only thing that I could kind of glean from the article that um, that gave me any insight into it at all was this one part where he said, and this is Jeffrey Katzenberg commenting on Diller. Barry would always say there's no natural momentum to a movie. It must be driven by somebody's belief and passion. And I, I kind of thought, well, that's every single movie is its own little business that you have. It's got to start a business every time you make a movie. That's a brand new business. That's why movie making's hard because businesses like to fail. It's so basically the way. The only thing these these things kind of come into life is through just the will and persistence of a single individual, which has been him in many instances, but it is not in. In IAC, all he does is buy and invest and flip. Yeah, yeah and they have control, was, right? His, that uh, matters. His Bad News Bears was one of the movies that he made. That and was like, about that, Bad News Bears, yeah. Yeah, isn't that kind of what, uh, you know, he's buying something like Ask Jeeves is like a Bad News Bears thing. Like, I'm, you know, I got a good price for it and maybe I can wring something out of these assets. So what, what, I'm just trying to take out, is there, is there anything to be learned from what they're what they're doing is there is it just switching i mean for for ask jeeves is it just we're not running it for growth anymore we're not trying to compete we're just going to try and get every last dollar of cash flow out of this thing that we possibly can i think that from a capital allocation standpoint it's actually very uh heroic to not try to build an empire around your one asset and to keep just plowing money into it until it gives up the ghost uh you know to to have the foresight and the the fortitude really to wind something down in a profitable way i i honestly like they get a bad name as like vultures but there aren't enough i think vultures in the ecosystem today uh and that's that's a a bull market thing as well like you don't there's you know there's not as much debt around so the vultures have kind of gone extinct but um, I'm I'm pro vulture actually from a, a, a it's reminiscent of Buffett, right? of capitalism. It's reminiscent well, it's, of Buffett with Berkshire. Yeah, and I I think yeah, one of sure. the things that is important from a minor, minority shareholder standpoint with somebody like IAC is they have proven that agency costs are not where you're going to have leakage, right? So well, say that again. What's that? What's that? What does that mean? So um, my best example that's coming to my head is uh, Graph Tech EAF, right? I am pretty sure, I might be mistaken on this, but I'm pretty sure that Brookfield tendered their shares to EAF at $22 a share when the, when the quoted market value was $12 a share. So if you look at what I perceive Brookfield did in the deal when they bought um, Howard Marks's firm and some of these other issues that people bring up about them if you get talking about Brookfield, I'm not sure that you want to be on the other side of them. I think that you could run agency cost risk because especially if they're controlling the votes, you may not actually realize what you think you're going to realize. I think that's one of the things that people revere so much about Buffett, right? Is he never let agency costs be the reason that his minority, I'm going to call them LPs, their shareholders, but didn't realize the benefit of the compounding. And I think Diller has done the same thing. And Malone has done the same thing, though, you know, people knock Malone. But if you follow what he does and you read the filings, they they don't, there's no um, malicious hiding. It's just you got to do your work. I think he's just run that to not pay tax, right? He, he everything else has been, he, I and mean, that's just achieved th through the letter of the law. It's not they're not doing anything particularly aggressive. They're just spinning off assets rather than selling them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. But I think some people take issue with how some of the some of the trackers get put together and stuff like that. And it look, it's complicated, right? I mean, if you're just some 
retail person that's not doing any homework, you could end up getting some leakage on some of that stuff. But I don't but I don't think that that's their shareholder base on average. I mean, they sort of have a more sophisticated shareholder base. Um, I look forward to what you're going to do. I'm going to try to work through it with you because all those companies are super interesting. I think, you know, I I sort of joked about 3G, but it is it is real. I mean, what they built in AB InBev is freaking incredible where they came from. There, I wonder, well, I don't wonder. I think they've probably hit this point where they're too big to make. The acquisitions now have to be so big to move the needle that I think you could argue Kraft Heinz was, at, was sort of forced in this AB InBev, SAB Miller one probably was too. Are they, but, are they doing what Jake would describe as the N plus one? They need to be back to N or N minus one? Yeah, I mean, everybody asked me I, on AB InBev, people were like, well, where's the next growth going to come from? My answer is maybe it's time to just pay down your debt and eat yourself. Um, but I, that's not in their DNA. So asking them to change who they are is not a fair fair ask. Could be fair. So I don't know. I, I don't know how the, I don't know how what the commonalities are going to be, but I, I think it's going to be interesting. I bet it's a combination of smart smart capital allocation, the industry you're picking to go into, right? I mean, software is really good. Heiko is aer aerospace after parts. Those are pretty high margin businesses. So just, be on, just on Heiko, I don't. I, I know a little bit about Heiko, but not. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who are who have studied it very, very closely. So I don't want to embarrass myself by saying what little I do know. But I do like the fact that they started out. It's it's a it's a father and two sons, who, I think the sons said, in the eighties, I want to do an let's do an LBO, and they got dad who was a I think Deloitte, partner. He was an accountant. He put up the capital, and they bought control of this uh busted basically listed company that was pretty small it might have been a 30 million dollar market cap might have been even less than that and it was it was a spin out that that made the aftermarket parts and i think i think they got a little bit lucky and then they re they but they understood then what what they had stumbled upon and then they set out to build an entire business that basically just kept on absorbing these things and a lot of it is regular they spend a lot of time in washington getting their parts approved and making sure that they're better than the OEM parts, so that they never, they don't want a, a failure to ever be attributed to a Heiko part. Yeah, well, and it's I mean, you were going to say the words, but it is regulatory capture. That's what I, right? regulatory uh, arbitrage. That's what I was going yeah. for. Yeah, yeah, it is. And and I talked to somebody that's in that industry, and the barrier to entry to get your parts approved is so high, and going through the FAA. There's only a couple competitors that can actually do it. So then it's a matter of trying to price high enough that you're not or that you're returning capital to yourself, but not so high that the regulators come after well, you. Interestingly, they said they run at a 15 percent. They aim for a 15 percent gross margin, which is exactly what Costco does. Yeah, that is interesting. I've, somebody's going to get mad at me. I haven't done enough work on it. No, I, I haven't either. I'm going to do a little bit more so that people can get really angry next week when I say, this is how much <laughs> work I'm going to do. <laughs> when you're yeah, really you and I should have some ass. hot takes and then people get all mad. Uh, I guess we've got to do the mailbag. Yeah, one thing before we get to that. If anybody's listening to this and they haven't listened to your latest interview, what was it, Arquitos? Is that how you yeah. pronounce it? Man, that was a good interview. That's an interesting one, right? Yeah, Stephen Keel from Arquitos, and he also Ooh. runs uh, S the site S Y T E is the ticker. That was awesome. Yeah, that was good one. Don't hear enough deep value, you know, like true deep value conversations. Deep value wheel of dealers, man. deep value special yeah. situation wheel of dealers. The whole thing is balance sheet to income statement arbitrage, which I thought is kind of interesting. It's a Cundle, Peter Cundle. Don't know anything about him. I couldn't really, I couldn't really track down much information on him. Does anybody know where you find some good stuff on Peter Cundle? Yeah, he's got a book. Um, he's a Canadian fund manager, wasn't he? And he, um, I think he, I might be getting this wrong, but uh, <clears throat> wasn't he a Watsa acolyte potentially? Hmm. Uh, but he has a book, and I think it, what was it called? There's always something to do, something like that. Hmm. So yeah. yeah it's, He's a little known. He's kind of off the radar, though. Yeah, you know, Canadians, we don't pay got, enough attention to him. I've got <laughs> one mailbag question. It's kind of a. This might be a little bit too uh, 
too detailed for this, but let's just throw it out there and just work through. We don't have to give the answer. We'll just work through the, work through the problem. Uh, following, I'm a value nerd, and right now I follow the first Chrysler Peugeot merger. Uh, for, uh, Fiat Chrysler, did I say first Chrysler? Fiat Chrysler plans to distribute 5.5 billion uh, euros to shareholders at closing of the deal, along with $1.1 billion ordinary dividend. Assuming the deal takes 15 months to close, I'm getting a 26% yield pre-tax based on a 14.11 cent current price. $14.11 cent current price. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the merger and the cash distribution to shareholders over the next 15 months? That's from Corbin in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Thanks, Corbin. Good question. Bill, I'm going to let you take this easy one. Uh, thanks. So knowing nothing about this deal. It's a merger arbitrage uh, question. Yeah. And what did you say the return was? It's north of 20%, right? 26% yield pre-tax. I think he's saying on 15 months. So it's, I guess the I guess the, the IRR is a little bit lower than that, which I could calculate it. But it's going to be, it's going to be 22, 23, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to this question. I can tell you that to, that kind of return is super interesting. Uh, the Agnelli family is really, really smart. And I don't see real realistic reasons why Fiat Chrysler shouldn't be able to merge with somebody. So um, it seems to me to be a fruitful pond to fish in. I'm, I'm not sure I can lend any more than that. But it sounds like you're thinking about it, right? Yeah, I think that, that I think that that process that he's described is is the right is the right way to think about it. And I, I think that you know, worst case scenario, you end up buying Fiat Chrysler or Peugeot. I mean, I don't think that's a bad outcome either. That's right. I mean, I I think whenever you're playing the the merger arb game, you want to think about if this thing busts apart, what do I own, and am I okay with that? Um, you know, and and then that's probably a less than I don't know what thirty percent probability that it doesn't go through. But I like I said, I can't I handle work. handicap that. But I would I would yeah. um, I would be inclined to do that deal in a special situations portfolio. Any concerns about uh, the capital being sucked out of a very capitally intensive business and like hamstringing the company, and then you end up with maybe they have to raise later because they were over aggressive on taking money out of the business. Are we buying the stock to hold, or are we just playing the uh, the merger arb? Well, I own sell Fiat Chrysler, well, I so, yeah. and I like Fiat. I've owned Fiat Chrysler for a long time, and it's had a pretty good run since I, I think it was like 2016 or 2015, something like that, since I bought it. I actually bought it with. I, I leaped into it. Ooh, tasty! Because it was one of that those things tasty. that, like, was it like five bucks or something? And I think that yeah. the 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 uh, the. Uh, the options, like the two-year options, were like a buck or something like that. So I thought, well, this is probably one of those opportunities where if you get a good run out of it, you'll get. It's going to work, or it's not going to work. It's going to be the only outcomes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or your can... post Ferrari spin. That was post Ferrari spin. Yeah. That's when I missed. Chalk that up on the. You went looking. You were my a screen. bonehead. Lot. Oh. It was the cheapest thing in my screen. Cheapest no, thing well, in my large screen. I've... Fiat, I got a piece of, but Ferrari, I always thought it was too rich, and yeah, that's that was the wrong thought. The ensemble guys, uh, when they discussed Ferrari, I was like, yeah, that's great analysis. I missed that one. <laughs> yeah. It seems so obvious in hindsight, doesn't it? Yeah. This whole yeah. game is so obvious in hindsight. It's the, so hard looking forward. I recorded a podcast with Ensemble. If you're interested in Ferrari, listen to that one because those guys have uh, this great analysis. Everybody thinks of Ferrari as like a, a luxury market, which it is, so, but like a something that would therefore be very sensitive to the cycle. But the way the interesting thing is that they have the, the you have to kind of be a Ferrari aficionado. You have to have already expressed your love for Ferrari, and then they have limited edition. We're going to make 200 of these things, and they call you up and they say, "It's a million dollars." Uh, we've got you down for one. You're allowed to say no. It's not like you don't. You have to take it. But if you say no, you never get back on the list. Isn't that wild? I mean, it's yeah, like amazing. Uh, it's talk about like exploding offers, you know, in the Cialdini sense. So I mean, you need to be really... a really price insensitive buyer, and you need to have a big wallet to be able to drive around in a Ferrari. So you're really making a statement in a Ferrari, probably more than any other car. Well, did you read the article about the guy whose job it is to say no to people that want to spend $2 million on a car or whatever? <laughs> like, he's just the guy that says, sorry, you're my 51st best customer, and this only goes to the top 50. 
that's <laughs> that's a good place to be in. brutal and those guys aren't ex- they're not used to no right probably that's right yeah number 51 gets pissed off i mean you start getting some questions what do i have to do here that's but that's why you got to be you got to be you got to take it when they say so because there's there's 51 is standing there ready to take the car and if you're if you're in the top 50 and you don't you just never get back on that list I need to do I've been saying that I need to do work on this forever it's I don't actually want to do it but Porsche are not Porsche Volkswagen they've got some brands in that entity um I mean I understand Lamborghini doesn't have the same history and whatever that Ferrari does but Lamborghini to me is modern art and Ferrari's classic art I'm not sure that people aren't I think they can push some uh some price on Lambos. The Lambo. I could be wrong. Yeah, that thing. How is bad, sweet. Fight with How your bad crypto gains. A, How bad did you want a Countach when you were like ten years of old? Of course, that was on my Y wall. So, so hard. It's the Porsche 911, and Porsche's also in that uh, entity. I, I so think... is Bugatti. So is Bentley. Ducati, even though it's a motorcycle. I mean, they got some brands. I think that if you had some Tesla gains, you could use that to go and buy a Lambo. Oh, for sure. How, I'm, how much I'm just longer gonna do we buy need? Here. Who cares? It's Before only going Tesla's, up. Uh, market cap's bigger than Volkswagen. Yeah, that's right. Maybe Tesla will just uh, do a stock uh, stock acquisition of Volkswagen. <laughs> Get All some right. scale. That Phil. would be a gangster move. <laughs> we're we're <laughs> coming up on be. time, fellas. So let's let's do the uh, let's do the wrap up. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, you guys want to say goodbye? Have a good one, folks. I'll see you next week. Shake it up, stop when the clock hits 13.